Hello, Kevin Clarkson here. I'm inviting you to be with us at our Pikes Peak Prophecy Summit this June 17, 18, and 19 in lovely Colorado Springs. We have a wonderful jam-packed three days for you with over 20 prophecy specialists and speakers. Let me give you a couple of three highlights that will be there. On Friday night, we're going to see a premiere screening of The Samaritan. It's the true story in film of the uh, Romanian communist regime and how that came to fall by the influence of Christians there in the land. It's by director Kevin McAfee who will be with us live and in person. And then on Saturday we have Bob Cornuk with us who will be discussing his possible location for the temple that is a new site being proposed. This would change everything in the Middle East. And then finally on Sunday we wrap it up with the great rapture debate. We have a pre-trib rapture and a post-trib rapture specialist who will go head to head and we will take place. I hope you'll be there with us. It's going to be a great conference. See you Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Clarkson. I'm joined today by a new friend of our ministry, Brent Miller. Hello, Brent. It's a pleasure being here, doctor. Thank you. Let me reintroduce you. We've already done a show, but uh, for those who might have missed it, Brent is a a producer and uh, very, very much... um, learned and skilled at technology and uh, he has actually helped produce the most distributed Christian documentary of all time. It's known as the Final Prophecies. The new project that's come out about six months ago is called Decoding the Future. It's eight and a half hours walking through the book of Revelation verse by verse, not only with classroom setting but on the site. Uh, Archaeological work is done and explanations are given. And it's absolutely one of the finest things I've seen. We're going to be looking at today's program uh, at some of the instances in Revelation chapter 8. So you'll want to stay tuned for that. In the meantime, Brent, before we start, let me tell our guests that you will be one of our, uh, to us, new guests at our Pro- Pikes Peak Prophecy Summit in this June, this summer. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a pleasure. I'll be there. Thank you. Well, we look forward to having you because we have about 20 plus great speakers mm-hmm. Three days of packed information on prophecy, Bible teaching, and fellowship with believers of like heart and looking for the return of the Lord. And for you to be there with us will be a real treat. Thank you. And to those of you that are watching, I hope you're making your plans to be with us at our Prophecy Summit. That will be June 17, 18, and 19. And you can register for the low cost of $90 for all three days. And go to our website or call the 800 number on your screen. You will also be able to have special hotel room rates at the Marriott in Colorado Springs if you act now. Anyway, let's get to uh, the word of God, the revelation he gave us. And uh, we're talking about fires from heaven. Yes. Yeah. Uh, why fires from heaven and when? Well, I want to discuss in scientific terms when God starts pouring out his wrath. Um, when, Noah's, when Noah was promised by God a covenant that he would not destroy the world by water again. And we, we later learn that it's going to be by fire. So if we look at when Christ starts to pour out his wrath on the unrepentant world, we should expect to see that he's doing it through fire in keeping with his, his, his promise to destroy the world by fire. Um, but keep in mind that the church is going to be raptured before this event. We are not going to experience the wrath of God. The church is not meant for his wrath. So we will be raptured before that event. But let's just, let's just move back just a little bit. Um, Prophecy in the news um, is amazing. You, you look at all the world events. You look at the social unrest political convergence, religious convergence, uh, the rise of ISIS. You look at all of these things, relate them to the scriptures, the Old and New Testament, and you show us all the effects on earth that are happening right now, showing that the fulfillment, the stage for the fulfillment of prophecy and the the final entrance of the Antichrist, it's all being staged right now. It is it's, a convergence. It, it is being set up right now and you're bringing this to us on a weekly basis, which is amazing. Um, but There are very few people who want to step beyond the world. Um, If you look at Revelation, it talks about so many things that are going to be happening in the sky. So if you look outside the world, political, social, economic, and religious 
events that are happening. And if you look to the sky and if mm -hmm. you look outside our world, shouldn't the convergence of events that lead to the events that Revelation talks about, shouldn't those also be starting? Shouldn't we see signs of these events starting to converge in the heavens? And we do. Um, well, we'll um, tell us what kind of signs you're alluding to that are beginning to come together. Well, if we look at Matthew 16, for example, um, it says that we should look for signs in the heavens. We are told to look for signs in the heavens. And even though there don't seem to be signs to us, there actually are. There are a few that are converging. Um, we're also told that the stars of heaven will fall in Revelation 6.13 as uh, the analogy as of a fig tree being shaken of an untimely wind. Uh, Mark 13 also tells us of the same thing of the the trees of heaven, uh, the, the um, stars of heaven will fall in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that these signs or the foundation for these effects are already starting to happen. So let, let me go back. <coughs> let me step back for one moment and not talk about prophecy for a second. All right. Let's talk about if these signs are actually happening you and I typically don't look up there and we wouldn't know it. So who is looking up there and do, what do they see? Well, um, it appears, and I say this very strongly, that the world governments, the major governments of the world are taking notice and they see something that the general public is not seeing and hasn't seen. And I also am going as far as to say that they have been taking measures to protect themselves for these future events that are being prophesied. Uh -huh. um, in terms of what they're doing, let's look at what the governments are doing to give us a clue as to what they might be seeing. In the last few years, we have heard various indications, uh, every now and then a, uh, a news report of a government such as Norway creating a seed vault a seed vault that is in the Arctic Circle, 600 feet off the ocean floor, uh, bored into a granite mountain where millions of seeds on the planet could be stored. And at um, neck-breaking speed, they built this, collected all the seeds. They're still uh, putting all the seeds in the planet on it. So we hear about that one seed vault, but in reality, there are over a thousand seed vaults all over the planet being built and being seeded. Why? What are the governments seeing that we don't know? In addition, the governments are building more and more underground what we might refer to as small cities. They're just not hollowed out Cheyenne Mountain for a military base. Um, we have, in addition to NORAD, we have a uh, mountain in Virginia. We have rumors of mountain in Denver. Uh, un underneath the airport. Um, yeah, well, and and there's, it's not just our country that's doing this. Many, many other countries are doing this. And we find it interesting that when uh, in our last talk we talked about an upcoming pole shift and how um, the scriptures tell us that the kings of the earth hide in the rocks and, you know, these assumingly mountains, underground cities, and, you know, that doesn't protect them. Nothing is going to protect them from the wrath of God. So they are actually building these things. Now, in addition to that, and this is, I find, even more interesting, NORAD made an announcement. The, our U.S. government made an announcement that NORAD is going to have, starting to be housed in NORAD, all the electronic equipment um, is being flooded into NORAD, and I quote, to have it protected from a natural EMP. <laughs> Well, there's no such thing as a natural EMP. Um, where would that come from? So they're looking for something that we're not seeing. Now, for those who may not be familiar, electromagnetic pulse. Yes, yes, which would end up taking out all communication satellites, all computers, all of our technology, all the power grids around the planet, unless it's specifically protected. So apparently there's something inside the Cheyenne Mountains that they feel will protect the equipment they're moving in there from an EMP. A natural EMP. But and what would cause a natural EMP? Well, 
let's look at a few things that they're seeing. Um, the magnetic field of Earth, as most of us know, protects us from the solar winds. The solar winds are a, uh, a proton stream that is coming from the sun. It is constantly being bombarded through our solar system and if we didn't have our magnetic field it would be hitting the earth. It would fry the earth and all life on earth would die within a matter of decades. But because we have this magnetic field it's, it's more like a shield around the earth. The, the stream hits the shield and it moves around the shield. When you have intense um, bursts from the sun you can actually see the aurora borealis being created due to the interaction in the upper ionosphere of the solar wind and our Earth's magnetic mm -hmm. field. Now, what the governments are seeing is that the magnetic field of the Earth is weakening, and it is weakening dramatically. The European Space Agency said in 2014 that the Earth's magnetic field is weakening 10 times greater than they ever thought possible. Um, if you have a weaker magnetic field of Earth, it is more vulnerable to these emissions from the sun. So that's the first thing they're seeing. They're seeing that the Earth is becoming more and more vulnerable. Was that, but is that enough to say that the seeds will be affected and we have to protect ourselves in caves? No, they're seeing something else. Mm -hmm. In the last 12 years, NASA, well, NASA always monitors. We have space agencies that monitor emissions from the sun. But in the last 12 years, NASA has had to increase the measuring capability of their satellites two or three times um, because the emissions from the sun are becoming so great and so random that it has actually exceeded their scales on the satellite so they no longer can tell what the measurement should have been because it pinned the measurement capabilities of the satellites. So they have to recalibrate the satellites, launch new satellites which much, with much wider range of capability and all of a sudden those are pinged. So the sun is emitting much greater uh, levels of x-ray emission and other forms of emission in the last 12 years. Now this pattern is similar to what we see in earthquakes. We see, and if you just look at the large earthquakes, not all the little micro small, if you look at all mm -hmm. the micro earthquakes, there's two million a year. All right, so ignore all the micro ones. But if you look at the large earthquakes, there are more earthquakes and they're becoming more frequent, similar to the phrase, you know, as birth pangs. Right. Um, the intensity increases and the duration decreases. We're seeing the same pattern with e emissions coming from the sun. It's the same pattern in the heavens. But that's not all. When you have these emissions from the sun, and the, it, the, we know that the sun is becoming less stable. Well, in 2012, something happened on the surface of the sun that NASA, the European Space Agency, and all the other astronomy astronomers that saw it around the world did not report to us until 18 months later in July of 2014. What they saw is a massive CME blast. Uh, CME is coronal mass ejection. A surface of the sun itself shot from the sun. And these CMEs shoot randomly in spherical locations around off the s surface of the sun. But, but you used the word massive. This was massive. In fact, the fact that it was massive wasn't the issue. The fact that as the Earth moves around the sun, it creates a plain ecliptical plane. This particular CME mass went right on our plane, literally three weeks behind the Earth. If our planet was three weeks further back, most of the life on Earth would not exist. I would not be talking to you today. They saw that and they kept it hidden from the world. And this is when all the pressure governments of the world started making massive seed vaults, building underground cities, and then uh, NASA launched the stereo satellite system so they could see from two different directions these coming out. The uh, European Space Agency, they have a, a network of satellites they call Swarm to monitor this. Um, but it doesn't give them much of a, it only gives them maybe an 8-10 hour window to see these a uh, blast coming toward the Earth. Um, the reason I mention this is because the governments of the world are preparing for something.
Mm-hmm. We would have been sent into the dark ages if this would have hit us. They see that. They also see we're more vulnerable with our magnetic field collapsing and that our sun is becoming more unstable. But what does that have to do with the scripture? And that... Well, does the scripture mention yeah. something like you're describing? Um, does the Bible describe fire yeah. or a CME hitting the earth? Yeah, let me... Um, the, the scripture doesn't use scientific terms, but it comes as close Obviously. as possible as it can in describing. Descriptive terms. Descriptive terms. Let me describe, without using, saying what the scripture shows, let me describe what would happen if a CME blast were to leave the surface of the sun. Remember, it has mass. It's a fourth state of matter. Think of it as liquid fire. It has density, and it's fluid. Um, but it's fire through and through. It's not just, say water that's on fire it's literally a ball of fire and every part of it is fire so that you have this mass coming toward the earth the first thing that happens is the atmosphere would be pushed aside so that the upper stratosphere is touching the minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit of outer space near the upper atmosphere the moisture inside the stratosphere would instantly crystallize This pressure wave then continues to push through the stratosphere, pushing all those ice crystals together, forming hail. The scriptures talk about hail as 100 pound, 150 pound chunks. This is quite possible when you look at this scenario. It is not possible looking at thunderstorms and how hail is formed naturally moving up and down a cumulonimbus cloud. But it is very easily possible with this scenario. So then you have have this plasma fire literally mingled or or sitting side by side with massive hail chunks being compressed moving through the atmosphere at this point the scientists theorize that we're looking at a temperature of a minimum of 6,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit the the outer skin of all airplanes vaporize at 1200 degrees Mm. so as this moves through the atmosphere it would vaporize every single plane every bird every animal in its path and all the people flying in planes. Now that is a lot of people. On any given day in the United States, they estimate there's around 50,000 or more planes with people in them flying above the United States, most private. So all of that would be vaporized and then hitting the ground. When this plasma hits the ground, it would just spread out like a liquid, viscous manner, wiping out everything in its path, frying everything in its path, every blade of grass. Now, with that description of what really would have happened scientifically, let me read what Revelation says and what John saw. And this is the first trumpet. Revelation 8, 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same sequence. The hail, fire, the blood, the earth, the trees, and the grass. Now, so we're looking at the trumpets of God being blown right now in the midst of the tribulation period. Right. When the wrath of God starts to be poured out, we expect fire. And this is the first effect. And one third of the land mass, the vegetation is the judgment against. And it then begs the question, if the Bible is literal, what third? Now, we know after this point in Revelation, the Bible talks about various countries. Ethiopia, kings of the east, uh, bear from the north, uh, mentions uh, Europe, the countries surrounding Israel, and of course Israel. So, if that two-thirds of the world is still mentioned, what one-third is it talking about? Remember, it's land mass. It's not ocean. Yeah, so in the other hemisphere. Exactly. So... Um, it, if you take it literally, it truly is North and South America, but it's more than that because we only represent 28% of the land mass. So it has to be something else in addition. So it could very well be, and it looks like, the North and South America are completely obliterated. That explains why we're not in prophecy after this point in time. Why America's not mentioned. Correct. Well, folks, we're talking to Brent Miller, and before we get to the second and third trumpets, I want to just tell you about what he's speaking of. This uh, actual content and material is covered thoroughly uh, in a DVD or Blu-ray set called Decoding the Future. Uh, It is uh, absolutely one of the most incredible presentations of Revelation 
that I've ever seen. And it's eight and a half hours worth of uh, classroom, archaeological dig, um, interviews, experts, commentary, taking us verse by verse through Revelation and the content. And it's, it's utterly fascinating. What I really like about this as well, the target audience is a secular audience who might not uh, at first listen if we're just quoting the Bible, but when we begin to speak about science and uh, it's related to what's happening with events today, then they tune in and then the Bible is brought in at that point to make the strong connection with the truth and the work of God. This would be something to acquaint yourself with and not only that, but to use as a witnessing tool. Anyway, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It is about, uh, this says 585 minutes in length, seven <laughs> Blu-ray or DVD discs. And we are offering this at Prophecy in the News for a $50 less than uh, price than you can get at other places. Savings of $50. And if you order it now, we'll uh, be putting in free The Final Prophecies, which is also produced by Brent Miller. And it's, it's the most viewed Christian documentary and distributed of all time. Uh, this is incredible material. And uh, just tell people that, you know, you can call, as always, our 800 number that's there on the screen. Or go to our website, prophecyofthenews.com, and you'll be able to access those materials. But, um, you know, just to kind of give us a little more, we're yeah. looking at fire on the earth. Yes. And we've spoken of the first trumpet. But there are uh, a second and third trumpet that sound as well. Others beyond that, mm-hmm. but let's talk about the second and third. Yeah, the uh, the first the first trumpet destroys one third of the vegetation. The judgment ag- is against the vegetation. The second trumpet is against the sea life. Um, John describes the the um, event as a great fiery mountain uh, cast into the sea. Now if you have to look at the words literally with, without making any assumptions. Um, it doesn't use the same wordage as meteorites that are clearly meteorites later on as mm-hmm. coming from above. So cast could be underneath. The problem with the meteorite uh, vision of a mountain is you don't have meteorites shaped as mountains and they're definitely not on fire. And if you cast them into the sea, they'd, they'd fizzle out immediately. And if you have one big enough to actually hit, say, the Pacific Ocean that was so big that it would actually kill one-third of all the marine life in the, on the planet, it would probably create such a huge tsunami that it would kill half the population of the planet with all, you know, 80% of the population living around the coast. So you but, rule out a meteor. Correct, because you know, the judgment is not against people. It's specifically against sea life. But if you look at John seeing a supervolcano coming up from the bottom of the ocean being cast into the sea from above, from below the ocean up, you then see a mountain. It is on fire. The water isn't putting it out. And what do they give off? They give off an incredible amount of soot and they give off ash and poison. A big enough mountain would spread throughout the whole ocean and then kill one third of all the marine life. So we see the second uh, judgment as a super volcano in the in the ocean that kills the marine life the third judgment the third trumpet third judgment is a fire as well we see that clearly from above meteorites that come down and strike a third of the fresh water on earth now what's interesting about this is if you take that literally there's no such place as a single spot on earth that has one third of all the fresh water on right. earth. in fact fresh water is scattered everywhere so you're looking at a scattering of meteors everywhere now the judgment would then be against anything that drank that water or had to drink that water for survival technology is gone you can't purify the water so all mammal and all land-dwelling animals that rely on the water would one third of them would die because one third is now poison. So there is a th- there is a symmetry between the uh, I will, I'll call deconstruction days or judgment days paralleling the construction days uh, in Genesis. Let, let, Creation. Yes. Let, let me. A sequencing in ex- reverse. Exactly. He has an order to everything. He's order to creation and an order of destruction. Uh, for example, very quickly. Um, At the end of the third day, he says that the plant should grow. You know, the vegetation grow, the seeds that are in the land should grow. Well, at the beginning of the fourth day, you have the vegetation on earth. So 
in the in the days of creation the fourth day has the vegetation the first trumpet destroys one third of that vegetation in the fifth day he creates all the sea life in the second trumpet he destroys one third of the sea life on the sixth day he creates all the mammals creepy crawly things on the ground on the third trumpet he destroys one third of them so the mm -hmm. destruction sequence is one third plants one third sea life one third man and those are only three judgments of the next you know the seven trumpets and then you have seven vials and seven bowls so you know there that's the first three and fire from heaven yes uh, that that's really a frightening scenario and as we've said in the early part of the program brent miller um, we who know christ will not be here we were not yeah. appointed unto wrath uh, but to obtain salvation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Exactly. And what? I'm, I'm glad for that. Was there anything else you'd like to add at this point about the uh, fires from heaven? Um, yes, we um, we see the stage being set for the Antichrist. We see that happening around us. We see ISIS. We see trouble in the Middle East. We see all the countries of the world starting to turn their back on Israel. Everybody will turn their back. We will turn our back on Israel. Israel will be alone. We see all these events, pieces starting to be taken from the world. We see the foundation being laid here on earth, politically, religiously, socially, economically, emerging, setting the stage for the Antichrist. We also see when we look to the heavens, the foundation being laid for these events. And I think the reason God is showing us, for example, why a massive CME blast missed the earth by three weeks mm is there's a reason for everything there's no randomness to show us that time is near the foundation is being laid for the future events now the world will see all of these events both man-made and natural events as just random acts they won't see ha god's hand in it so they won't repent um they won't have faith in God. They won't turn to God. But we see all of these events unfolding as they were prophesied. So what it tells me is that as the scriptures tell us, we won't know the day or the hour, but we should know the season. And we see the season coming up. All these things coming to pass. We have God's script in his holy scripture. And we want to encourage you to read that scripture, to be watching and looking for the return of our Lord Jesus, to be growing in holiness to be sharing your faith with those who are going to perish without him and if you're here without christ watching us today call on his name he died for you and rose again let's keep looking up